again. It's good to see you. I'd like to welcome our visitors online as well as here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, since so many people are thinking about the topic of the resurrection of Jesus, I'd like to spend some time on that in our sermon today. Those of you who are not uh, visitors, of course, know that we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus every week in our communion through the Lord's Supper. But today I want to focus on it in my sermon. This week I was reading and I came across this proverb. You can put truth in a grave, but he won't stay there. Jesus said, I am the truth. And those who sought to stop Jesus from revealing himself uh, and taking the truth to the world killed him and sealed him in a tomb. But Jesus wouldn't stay there. He, he reminded me uh, in his actions of what Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 24. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And that's the key idea. You can put truth in a tomb, but you can't keep him there. In a moment, I want to look at chapter 11, where Jesus uh, meets his uh, family friend, uh, and a man named Lazarus, uh, who has died, comes out of a grave alive. And Jesus says there, I am the resurrection. But before we do that, stop and think about all the I am statements that Jesus made as he was uh, walking and teaching amongst the people. He not only said, I am the resurrection. He said, I am the bread. I am the light. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am God's son. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But in all the I am statements made by Jesus, he never said, I am the death. When I was doing mission work in Slovakia, our summer camps would have about 100 high school and, and university age youths. And we would teach them the a cappella songs that were popular with our young people in America. And, we, and some of them were uh, translated into Slovak. And usually uh, there was a small cathedral in the village near where we were uh, that was usually empty during the week. And we would go there. And we would sing in those little cathedrals because the acoustics were wonderful. And with a hundred of our young people singing, the people in the village could hear it. And pretty soon they'd start coming in and smiles on their face and, and sitting down uh, to listen to the praises uh, to God. And I noticed in each of these places that we would visit that there were statues of Jesus. There were statues of Jesus on the cross often statues of Jesus laying on a slab as if he had just died. And the, the feet were worn from people touching and kissing them. They had a very sincere concern for what happened uh, to Jesus. But it was a little sad to me. Uh, I always thought how great it would be if they made a statue of Jesus smiling with his arms out, ready to get him, give him a hug, because Jesus is not dead. He's alive. That's why I like that, that uh, gospel of Matthew. Okay, I'm going to have a problem with this. Sorry. I like the gospel of Matthew. If you've ever seen it, it's part of the series. And that particular uh, gospel, I call it the smiling Jesus. Uh, because Jesus is so welcoming and so smiling. And sometimes you see in the, in the context, you think, well, of course he would smile. Uh, why, why wouldn't he? This reminds me of something Michelangelo said. He turned to his fellow artists one day, and he was filled with some frustration. He said, why do you keep filling gallery after gallery with endless pictures on the theme of Jesus in weakness? Jesus on the cross, and most of all, Jesus hanging dead. Uh, he asked, why do you concentrate on this passing event as if it were the last work? The dreadful scene lasted for hours, but to the unending eternity, he said, Jesus is alive. Christ rules and reigns in triumphs. And Michelangelo was right. Jesus never said, I am the death. In John chapter 11, Jesus went to Bethany. Uh, he's visiting his friends, Mary and Martha. And their brother, Lazarus, has died. And the two sisters, naturally, were very sad. But Martha was especially upset in verse 21. 
She knew that if Jesus had come earlier, he could have healed Lazarus and her brother would not have died. Uh, And Jesus begins to talk to her about the resurrection. Listen to verse 25 in John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now think about Martha and Mary and how they felt that day. Uh, Because we have similar experiences in our life. Have you ever looked pain and suffering in the face and wondered why it cannot end? Has death ever taken the one you love so dearly you thought, how can I go on? Have you ever compared yourself to others and found that your value seems far less than theirs? If you can say yes to any of these questions, then you know how Mary and Martha felt when their brother died. You can also understand how Mary Magdalene and the other women felt when they came to the tomb of Jesus on Sunday morning after the crucifixion. Jesus was the one who gave their lives meaning, the one who loved them when no one else cared, the one who gave them courage and hope to try again when they made mistakes so terrible that they're not mentioned. He was the one who promised a relationship that would never end. The one who looked beyond physical beauty and human popularity and loved them and valued them individually as God's own creation. This man who had been so vibrant and alive was now only a memory from the past. To understand Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection, it's helpful to go back to that sad Passover day and recall what happened to him. Mary and Magdalene and the other Mary watched as the lifeless body of Jesus was taken down from the cross late Friday uh, afternoon. And the women stayed close to Jesus, as close as they could, during his last days on, on earth. And except for John, all the other disciples were gone fearful for their lives. But the women stayed near Jesus. They followed, in fact, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who had gotten permission to take down the body of Jesus uh, and to give him a burial. So he, he, he uh, spoke to Pilate, and Pilate agreed after they tested that Jesus was dead. And Joseph wrapped the body in clean linen and placed it uh, in the tomb. And with everything in place, the stone was rolled, uh, in front of the tomb and sealed. The, woman, the women observed all of this, uh, and naturally it would cause them to be sad. Uh, throughout the Gospels, we find that Jesus treated people in ways uh, that had never been treated positively before. He gave them new life. He gave them dignity. So early on Sunday morning, Mary and the other women made their slow and sad journey uh, to the tomb. A few years ago, I read a, about a man who worked for a newspaper, and he also was very sad. He had a close friend who had died, and the family members had asked him if he would say something uh, at the funeral, and he decided he wanted to have his part to be consistent with the way that is as spoken in God's word. So he went to the Gospels, and he looked uh, throughout the Gospels trying to find an example of Jesus teaching something and doing something at a funeral. And he began discovering uh, that Jesus didn't do funerals. Uh, In fact, when Jesus came to a funeral, you would see the most amazing things. A young boy in a coffin gets up and goes to his mother. A young girl gets out of bed and has lunch with her parents. A man who's been in a tomb for three days comes out to greet his sisters and friends. When Jesus came to a funeral, the funeral was over because you can't have a funeral when the dead person comes back to life. And so this guy wrote that he couldn't look to Jesus and say what Jesus said. There are many other things he could find in the scriptures. But what about his own funeral? What about Jesus's funeral? In Matthew 28, 1 through 10, the women disciples began early in the morning to prepare for the funeral of of Jesus. In their mind, Jesus had not uh, had a proper burial because the Jews had been in such a hurry to get uh, everyone off the cross before the Sabbath. So in Matthew 28, 1 through 10, 
we see that they uh, came at the, on the first day of the week uh, after the end of the Sabbath. It says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went uh, to look at the tomb. Uh, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone uh, that covered the entrance and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid uh, of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Here's the good news. He's not here. Now, if you're the two ladies, that might not be good news because you don't know why he's not there. All right. Maybe soldiers took his body. We don't, we don't know what they might be thinking, but the angel encourages them by saying he has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay and then go quickly and tell his his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Uh, now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they, they ran to uh, his disciples, and suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go look, to, to, go to Galilee. There they will see me. Uh, so before the sun had risen on Sunday morning, they began walking uh, to the tomb of Jesus. They were going to give him uh, an, an additional uh, preparation, an additional funeral, you might say. There was only one problem with their plan. Jesus wasn't there. Uh, it's hard to give him a funeral when he refuses to stay dead. Uh, uh, when these people came, when these women came to Jesus' funeral, they discovered something that would change them forever. First, these women discovered that God was still in control. So often we wonder. We look around us and we see what's happening. And we wonder, is God still in control? Well, they learned that he was. Uh, there was an earthquake. The Roman soldiers guarding the tomb uh, fainted from fear. The angel rolled away the stone. Everything was made ready for them because they needed to look in and see that he wasn't there. It's not that Jesus had to have an open tomb door in order to get out. That wasn't necessary for, for him. But you know what was interesting as I was reading this? It reminded me of a report way back from November 1990, came out of, uh, of Israel. A reporter was talking about archaeologists in Israel who had excavated the tomb of Caiaphas. You remember Caiaphas? He was the high priest. It was Caiaphas uh, who was the leader in the plot to have Jesus arrested. Caiaphas arranged for Jesus to be convicted of blasphemy and turned him over after that to be crucified. Do you know what they discovered when they opened Caiaphas's tomb? They found Caiaphas. Now, not that he was doing very well. In fact, he was just bones and, and dust. But in fact, he was still there, uh, right where he had been buried. Do you know what the women found when they looked into the tomb of Jesus? Nothing. A bit of cloth is all that they found. Okay. Uh, why? Why was it so uh, dis different? Jesus wasn't dead is the reason. Uh, it, it's interesting that Caiaphas was a dead man in his funeral and Jesus was alive. Caiaphas stayed in his tomb until he was just bones. Jesus was gone in three days. Why? Caiaphas was just a man. Jesus is the Son of God. And when God is in control, things are done that man cannot do or sometimes even imagine. The disciples couldn't imagine that Jesus was resurrected and they resisted that idea, even though Jesus told them in advance. Uh, sometimes we're that way. The women then uh, hadn't thought about the fact that he would be alive when they came to the tomb, uh, because they had watched carefully what happened. They saw him die on the cross, and they saw uh, Joseph take him and put him in an empty tomb. And despite... Uh, how it looked on that Friday. On Sunday, it was plain that God was still in control. Not Caiaphas, 
not the powerful Roman soldiers, but God was in control. Have you ever found yourself on Friday discouraged by the sins in your life? Have you ever wondered, how will I ever survive the problems of this world? Has it ever been Friday and all you can see are your weaknesses and your defeats? Let me remind you of your older brother, Jesus. When you are at your lowest in spirit and in emotions, you have forgotten Sunday. You have forgotten that God is still in control. You have forgotten that God wants to resurrect your spirit and give you life and power to face every difficulty that this world throws at you. James said in James chapter 4, verse 8, come near to God or draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. When you feel that you want to give up, let your mind go back to that first Sunday. See the power and the resurrection of Jesus. Picture it in your mind. Get close to God in your heart and your mind, and remember, he is still in control. This is what the women disciples discovered. The women also discovered that death had been defeated, not temporarily, but forever. The angel told the women in Matthew 28, verse 5, Do not be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been risen, as he said. And the angel showed the women the empty tomb. And it was then that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary remembered Jesus' teaching, that on the third day he would be raised. And as they looked into the empty tomb, they believed the angel's testimony. They believed that God had raised Jesus to new life. Death had been defeated. Several, Several years ago, there was an article in Newsweek magazine about a state government. Uh, Sometimes workers in big organizations can be a bit impersonal. In fact, sometimes you just get a form letter and you look at it and saying, why did I get this? And this is the situation that happened in Greenville County in South Carolina. The Department of Social Service was, was writing to people who had been receiving money for food from the government. But this time they sent this letter uh, to a dead person. And here's what the letter said. Your money for food will be stopped effective immediately because we received notice that you have died. You may reapply if there's a change in your circumstances. (laughs) You know how they just fill in the blank, you know? Uh, And uh, I don't know about you. uh, From your chuckles, I'm assuming you have the same uh, experience that I have. And not in this modern world are we ever going to find someone like that who changed their circumstance. In fact, there's only one person I know who has the power to come back from the dead. And that person is Jesus Christ. There in that graveyard, the women discovered that Jesus was no longer dead, but alive. That God was still in control. That Jesus Christ had conquered death. They also discovered that they had the best good news ever told. That is why they hurried out of the graveyard. They had to tell their friends who were hopeless and had no clue uh, that Jesus was going to do and what he meant when he said on the third day. In Matthew 28, verse 7, the angel told Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And as they were hurrying out of the cemetery, they met the risen Lord. He said, greetings to the women. Uh, They fell at his feet and they worshiped them. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Uh, Notice that Jesus called his disciples my brothers. Now, normally in the Gospel of Matthew, he calls them when he's talking to them or about them, his disciples. That's the normal thing. But it's especially interesting here that he calls them my brothers in view of what they had just done. Peter had denied him three times, and the others had run, uh, to fleeing and hiding, not no- knowing what the meaning of his words were. But, but Jesus calls them my brothers. Uh, maybe there have been times over the last year when you've seemed in your behavior to have denied uh, Jesus. Perhaps you've fought with temptations and lost. Brothers and sisters, don't give up. Friday has passed and today is Sunday. Jesus is eager to forgive all sins. He is eager to give you new life even today. 
Uh, and that's a blessing that we see uh, that these women learn. If you will ask for his mercy, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the solution, John says, is don't lie about sinning. Guess what? We will sin. Verse 9, what's the solution? Confess to God, and he is faithful to forgive you. Today, uh, we have this blessing of knowing what these women learned because we can read in Matthew. Uh, uh, Jesus is ready to walk with us throughout the rest of our life and delivers to the Father a pure child of God. Jude verse 24 says, God is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. God makes promises that he keeps, and he's able to do this if we will draw near to him. In a world with with much suffering and death, where there's chaos from coast to coast, we have a message to deliver. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. And he will raise his people to a new life where there is no more suffering and no more death. All spiritual blessings are in Christ, including the resurrection. The apostles and prophets, guided by the Holy Spirit, uh, explained how we respond to what Christ has done. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, this is called the obedience of faith. The book of Romans is a popular book to look into to find God's plan of salvation. Uh, And it is there. Uh, Let me summarize the responses that are part of Romans chapter 1, verse 5. We hear or read about the life of Christ in the New Testament. We believe what we read, specifically that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died to pay for our sins and was raised to life uh, after his crucifixion. Number three, we repent or turn away from a life that's contrary to what's taught in God's word. Number four, we confess or acknowledge that we believe in Christ, that he is Lord. And number five, we're baptized in water. We are united with Christ and share in his death. We find forgiveness of sins. We receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means that all spiritual, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. In order to receive these blessings, that's where we need to be. If you'd like to know more about how to be in Christ, please let me know or another Christian here know of your interest. If you're already a Christian and you have a need or concern that you would like to share with the congregation, you can do that now as well. In a moment, we'll stand and sing an invitation song. And at the end of the song, I'll ask people to sit down. But if you have something that you would like to share, whether to know Christ personally uh, or some need that you have, please remain standing and I'll come to you. So let's stand and sing.